This seems like the moment. <laughs> it seems like everyone is mostly fed and watered. Uh, if you're if you're not, feel free to to get up throughout the day to do so. We put great store by making sure that people are fed and hydrated throughout the day. So I am just so pleased to welcome all of you today, those in this room, but also those who are watching on the live stream. I don't know where the camera is, but you know, I'll try to acknowledge you. Um, I think it's so fantastic to have the capability um, of doing a live stream so that it's not only just the people who are able to be here in this room with us, but that we can extend the impact and the conversation that all of you are going to bring uh, to a wider, wider audience. So thank you to everyone in the room and virtually. This is a really exciting day for us, um, and we're here to discuss the future of gender-sensitive data systems. And for those of you I haven't gotten the opportunity to meet yet, my name is Emily Corey Pryor, and I'm very privileged to be the Executive Director of Data2x. Uh, Data2x is housed at the United Nations Foundation, and our UN Foundation office in New York really has the privilege of being housed here at the Ford Foundation, just down on the third floor, um, which gives us the opportunity to utilize this beautiful space. So I know you're you're all going to be in a room all day talking with us about gender data and big data, and you're going to be loving it. Um, but at least you also get to be inside and having this amazing view um, and all of this natural light. So, so truly welcome. Some of you are maybe meeting us for the first time, and if you are, then welcome to you and what took you so long, and we can't wait to keep you in our orbit for as long as possible. Um, and I hope for those people who are just kind of getting to know us that you can indulge me for a few words at least about who Data2x is and what we do. So Data2x is a technical and advocacy platform, as I said, housed at the United Nations Foundation, and we work to improve the production and the use of gender data to inform better policies. We believe that in order for policies to have the opportunity to improve people's lives, we must have accurate data to inform those policies and monitor their success or their failure. The problem, of course, is that data on women and girls are missing. It's just not collected in many cases. And these gender data gaps hit every field uh, that probably everyone in this room cares about, from health to education to the economy to politics to human security to the environment. I personally do not believe that data systems are intentionally sexist. I don't think that it's data's job to solve all of our problems. Data is a tool. But the way that we collect and we use data is absolutely influenced by the society around us and the expectations and the biases that we all carry. We are globally too far behind on gender equality. I know many of us have heard the figure that this year the World Economic Forum found that it will take 208 years to achieve gender equality in this country. There's different ways of looking at that number and thinking about that number, but no matter, way you, no matter which way you slice it, that is unacceptably long. And it's also not right, and it's also short-sighted. So if we want change, then we need to commit to understanding how half the world's population experiences the world. And we cannot do that if we do not change the way that we collect and use gender data. In this era now of digital data that we're in, the pace of data collection and analysis and application has increased exponentially. And the risk has also increased exponentially. So we need to ask some crucial questions about who is involved, who benefits, how are these new data systems being built, and what are the ways in which those systems tie into decisions with a serious effect on people's lives. We have to intervene now to ensure that emerging data sources are wielded to fill the gender data gap, that data is used to work towards a more gender equal world. Today, part of why we're so excited and everybody on our team is so excited is that this marks the culmination of five years of work on big data and gender. Um, it's really since the inception of Data2x that we've been working on this. And it was something that we saw really as a gap even in our own understanding. Uh, we were looking at policy relevant data and trying to understand how official statistics um, and official data sources could be changed and improved to have a better and more full picture of gender. And we of course were aware of all of the new potential of that digital data could offer, but we weren't really seeing a lot of work on how digital data could be utilized for answering gender questions. And that's really what motivated us to kick off this work five years ago. 
And so the first thing that we did was to establish whether or not big data sources did have the potential to address key knowledge gaps on gender. We put out a paper on this um, a few years ago in 2017. I encourage you to go read it, but if you haven't, I'll just give you the headline, which is that it does actually have the potential to answer some key re research questions. And then we launched a challenge uh, to a broader community because the point of Data2x, the point of what we're trying to do is that it's not only about you know us, this tiny organization trying to lead the charge around gender data and all of the great organizations that have come along the way. It's also about instilling an interest and an enthusiasm and excitement in the official statistics community and in the data science community to really take up this charge, to say it is unacceptable that we lack the answers to these questions and we have to do something about it. And so we put out this challenge and we had this amazing response um, from so many different research teams around the world. And as a result, we were able to um, support some really great um, projects, some really great research projects. And so we're so happy to be showcasing this cutting edge research that our partners have done. This spans 29 researchers, 20 institutions, and eight countries. And each of these projects has performed a dual purpose of not only adding to the body of knowledge on their respective topic areas, but also pushing the boundaries of social and economic analytical techniques to derive insight. You'll also see that the project span a diversity of topics, including urban mobility, financial inclusion, street harassment, education, access to technology, women's paid and unpaid work, and attitudes towards violence against women. This, these, all of these topics, this multiplicity of topics and of people who are working on this, attests to what I think is the important fact that gender data is not a niche subject. It's not a subset of the wider data system, but should really be the bedrock of any high quality data system, whether that be deliberately collected by public bodies or passively generated and curated by our interaction with technology. Representativeness is a key quality marker for any statistician, and when the lives and experiences of vast portions of the population are not included, we just can't consider that representative. As an advocacy platform, it's really our privilege to be able to look to new horizons, to identify risks and opportunities, to either correct for or proactively prevent gender bias from becoming entrenched in data systems. We also want to ensure that data is used to answer the right questions. So it's not only thinking about what data we have, but it's about going at it from the perspective of what are the questions that we try to answer and what is the information that we need to have in order to answer those questions. And so one of the things, and you'll see some, some material about this, um, I think over on the side, but we've really been privileged to have a partner in this event, um, the Gov Lab at NYU. And alongside partnering with them for this event, we are also partnering with them on something called 100 Questions, which is trying to do exactly that. So starting from the questions we wanna answer, instead of only talking about the data we don't have, saying what are the questions we wanna answer and then how do we get the data to answer those questions? So I think throughout the day, we'll have an opportunity to interact with colleagues from the Gov Lab at NYU and to think about how this community of practice um, because make no mistake about it, now that you're all here, you are staying ours and you're gonna stay engaged with us in the best possible way. Um, uh, so I think there's really a lot that the people gathered in this room can do to support, to support that, that initiative and I hope that you will do so. We've really, um, as, we've, as we've done all of this research and as we've gone through these rounds of, of pilot projects and these proofs of concept, we now see that this wider community that we are a part of, the big data for social good community, the gender data community, is now under increasing pressure to scale up solutions that have been proven to provide insight. And this essentially presents us with an opportunity to ensure that these data, that these solutions and the data systems of the future that result are gender sensitive. An appreciation for both human rights and pragmatism would indicate that gender data, gender sensitive data systems should be the way of the future, but experience from the past indicates that they will only be gender sensitive if we make a special effort and if we demand it. And so I hope that armed with the new insights that you'll hear about today, that you'll be demanding alongside us. We have the research, we know that this is both right and smart, and now we need to get on with it. So I'm really, really so pleased that you've joined us and look forward to having you uh, stay on this journey. So I'm gonna give you just a brief overview of what today holds. 
there's an agenda. Everybody has um, a really snazzy, fantastic Data2x folder <laughs> at, your, at your spot. And um, inside that folder, you'll see the agenda, so you can get a, a view of what's coming up. You will also see in there um, our, uh, our report that is just coming out today. This has been a huge amount of work by several members of our team um, and all of our research partners who are here today. So I hope you'll take the time to, uh, to read that. And we'll be digging into all of that content throughout the day. I have just a few housekeeping items. Um, I know that everybody who's in New York has very hectic and busy lives. So I know that some of you hopefully will be able to stay with us all day. I also understand some people might not be able to. That's OK. Feel free to come and go. You can always catch up with us on the live stream later. Um, I want to know, want to make sure for everybody in the room, you know there's food and coffee and water and all sorts of things on the side of the room. So help yourselves. For those who need the restrooms, they're just past the elevators uh, to the left, I believe. Um, so please uh, make sure to make yourself comfortable and make this your, your home away for, from home uh, on the day. Lastly, I'll just say, if you're active on a particular form of uh, passively generated data interaction called social media, um, and I'm assuming that many of you are, we um, are, are on Twitter and you should be posting. We are using the hashtag, uh, hashtag big data for number four gender. So please just tag your posts and join the conversation online. So now I would like to invite our panelists <laughs> to the stage um, for our first session. And so may I have you join me here? We have one panelist. We're using technology this morning, y'all. It's going to be awesome. So we both have one panelist who's going to be on the stage with me and one panelist who's joining us, um, hopefully virtually. Are we, are we a go? <laughs> OK, great. Let me move over. Yes, so she'll be here. OK. Great. Let me just give a chance for people who were coming in to be able to get a seat. OK. Um, so I'll go ahead and get us started. Oh, good. Nuri is there. Hi, Nuria. <laughs> Hi. Um, OK, so uh, this session, our opening session, is really intended to sketch out what the new data landscape looks like today and the roles that each stakeholder has to play in making these systems gender sensitive. So just as a kind of scene setting, I should say at this point, I think what I mean, what we mean when we say gender sensitive, um, because it has numerous interpretations. So for, for us, we see this term as having two layers. So the first and most basic, of course, is ensuring that the data we have is disaggregated by gender or contains gender markers. And the second asks whether the data generated and the methods available for analysis truly represents the experiences of all genders. So the risk, of course, is that if we assume that gender neutrality of big data or in other forms of data, then when that data is acted upon, we can further entrench gender inequalities. So I think we just need to be really thoughtful about what we mean when we say gender sensitive data systems. So I'm really, really happy to, um, to introduce our panelists. And I actually might ask them to introduce themselves, if I may. I may I turn may. to the person on the, the, uh, the video, who's Nuria Oliver. Nuria, if you could just say a few words about you um, and who you are and who you represent, that would be great. And then I'll turn over to Julia to introduce herself, and then we'll go to questions. Make me busy possible. I'm Nuria Oliver. I am uh, by, by training. training uh, Research and I'm a director of research in uh, artificial intelligence and more specifically machine learning and the modeling of human behavior uh, from data using machine learning. Uh, for the past 10 years or so, one area that I first created at Telephonic R&D, then at Vodafone, and also is the core of the work of Data Pop Alliance where I'm chief data scientist, is the data of how to leverage big data and AI for social good. So I've done some projects, and with Datapod, we've done more projects in the intersection between data, machine learning, and gender. Um, and it's a great pleasure for me to be here today. 
Great. Great. Thank, Thank you, Nuria. Nuria. Doesn't work? Does it work? Do you hear me? Yes. yes. So, so my, my name is Julia Kempe, Kempe and, and I, I guess, I'm representing, representing the university as a stakeholder. So, so I am at NYU, NYU and I am the director of a uh, center for data science. It's called. It's it's a it's an interdisciplinary center um, at NYU that was established six years ago that has joint faculties, so the idea is to have you know, faculty collaborate across areas on all aspects of data science. So it has faculty, we're currently 16 joint faculty. It runs educational programs, it runs a, very, a rather big master's program in data science. We currently have 300 students on the ground. It runs a PhD program in data science and we also launched an undergraduate degree in data science um, this fall. Great. Well, I'm so glad that you're here and, you know, no pressure. You are not, uh, I know that universities are not a monolith, so you're not <laughs> expected to, to represent all of universities, but I'm really glad to have that perspective here. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll ask the first question, and it's a question that goes to both of you, uh, but Nuria, I'll start with you first. So the first half of this title is Big Data, Big Impact with a question mark, uh, which we'll get into that question mark as we go throughout the day. But I, I hope that you could elaborate a little bit for us, Nuria, on where you've seen big data have a clear impact and the potential that you see for big data um, to utilize big data for gender equality. Great, thank you. Well, that's a actually a very big question that you're asking me, so I'll try to be fast. I'll first talk more broadly about the intersection between big data and I would say social impact or positive social impact or, or public interest because big data and impact could be also, you know, commercial impact or, you know, economic impact and not necessarily uh, um, is positive for everyone in society, right? Uh, and then I'll talk about the specifics of gender. So in the context of data, uh, machine learning to analyze the data and sort of like social good, I would say this is a, Wall's movement for the past at least 10 years when the availability of large-scale human behavioral data has been possible. And the type of data that I'm the most uh, familiar with and I've worked on is uh, large-scale mobile data, data captured by the mobile network infrastructure, data that is collected by the cell towers as a result of the activities of the cell phones both smartphones and feature phones. This type of data has been used by many research groups in the world as a proxy of large-scale human behavior that could help us understand and model important aspects of different countries or societies, particularly in developing economies, because we cannot forget that mobile phones are ubiquitous even more so in developing economies. So there's been projects on inferring, for example, socioeconomic status from this large scale mobile data, and therefore identifying regions that uh, might be entering into uh, poverty or that might be more uh, disadvantaged economically. There's been projects on natural disasters and emergency relief response, because through the analysis of this data, we can assess roughly how many people might have been affected by a natural disaster and where the people are so we can better uh, establish the uh, relief and the emergency support that uh, the people might need. There's been uh, projects also uh, on uh, public health, um, particularly for infectious diseases and pandemics, uh, flu, Ebola, Dengue, malaria, Zika, and in fact, we've done projects on uh, malaria and, uh, uh, and flu and uh, Ebola because this type of data enables us to model large-scale human mobility. And we know that an infectious disease doesn't become a pandemic or doesn't spread if people don't move. So understanding human mobility is very important. So these are just some examples of areas where this type of data has impact and has been used for uh, the public interest and for social good. When we look into gender, from my perspective, the intersection between data and gender is at least threefold. So first of all, as you mentioned already, we could use big data as a tool to better understand the realities 
of women worldwide and to better quantify and identify gender inequalities. So if the data is a reflection of reality and if we are able to distinguish between the data that corresponds to females or to women versus men, then we can better understand uh, what is the reality you know, of women, something that we haven't had you know, access to until now. This is a very promising area and we've done work, for example, on identifying the differences in the behavior of uh, using mobile phones between men and women or detecting um, a financial inclusion projects, you know, where through the data we can identify differences in gender and so forth. Having said this, one of the key limitations that we need to be aware of in this first line of work is uh, how representative the data is of the underlying reality, because we are, we are finding that the data many times has biases, and those biases, unfortunately, uh, have a negative impact on minorities, including women many times. So what we think is reality is not really reality because there is this bias. The second line of work is on using big data to train machine learning algorithms that are used to make decisions that impact the lives of all of us. Decisions regarding medical diagnosis or insurance, you know, medical insurances or uh, judicial sentences or credit scoring, you know, for getting access to credit or immigration decisions. And what we are finding again is that while the goal is to have better decisions than human decisions, because we know that we humans are subject to conflicts of interest and biases and greediness and tiredness and all sorts of, you know, uh, uh, limitations that we have that make our decisions be suboptimal. While the idea is that through the use of algorithms and analyzed data, you know, we could make more fair and less biased decisions. Again, what we are finding is that if the data is biased, the decisions are not only biased, but sometimes even more biased because they magnify, you know, uh, those uh, biases. Or even if the data is not biased, but the algorithms are not properly designed, you could also actually uh, have a system that is um, having a negative impact on minorities and the more vulnerable groups, including women. And the last intersection between data and women is thinking of big data and AI as an industry. Unfortunately, the lack of gender diversity in this field is extremely worrisome. Uh, in many computer science departments in the world, there is barely 10% of females. And we talk about the data economy. We talk about an industry of only in Europe, uh, almost like a trillion you know, dollars or worldwide, much more. And we are talking about the fourth industrial revolution and how most of the new jobs are going to be jobs in technology. And at the same time, we have a field that has no gender diversity, where there is no representation of women, where women are possibly also going to be more affected by, by automation than men, because many of the jobs that traditionally women do are jobs that are probably going to be automated or semi-automated. And also we have a massive loss of innovation in fact, in Europe, the European Commission estimates that the lack of gender diversity in the tech sector could be costing Europe, I think it's something like 16 billion uh, euros per year. So that's another area of work of the intersection between data you know, and gender. Thank you, Nuria, for laying that out so, so clearly and so beautifully and also showing all the work that still needs to be done. Um, but on this last point that Nuria just raised, I'd love to, to turn to you, um, Julia, to hear, you know, Nuria at the end there was just talking about representation and, and what that looks like. And you are coming from the perspective of building a data science department and, um, and running that program and really thinking about the pipeline of, of people who are, who are walking your halls. So, could you tell me how, you know, how are you going about it and what, you're, what are you seeing, not only at NYU, but in some of your peer institutions as well, of how we really build representativeness within the community who's doing this type of research? Yes, so thank you for that question. So uh, while I agree with Nuria that 
the perspective could be bleak. I, I, I am actually more optimistic in that field. So what is happening at, at the universities is um, that data science is viewed as something new. So it's not computer science, it's not statistics, it's not mathematics. It's all of it together, but it's a new discipline. And as a result, um, I observed this now. I just actually returned from a leadership summit of you know, leaders in data science across the US. Um, and uniformly, what is the case is that people start building these new institutions over the last five, six years with a mandate to create something new. And that's a very big chance to change the culture because often the representation is, you know, there are no women, so women don't come, or, you know, the true same is true for minorities. It's, it's, it's very unattractive for many women to join a group that has either non or one woman among 50 people or something like that. And so there's a lot of conscious effort that I see in all kinds of data science um, institutes across uh, the US and also internationally to change this and just change the culture. And just for example at NYU, um, we started very early on to try to have a gender balanced cohort. And for the first time this year among the 152 or something incoming Master students, we have a majority of women. And the way we did it is, uh, you know, there's always an argument that you're facing, especially among perhaps more senior colleagues, is, oh, you lowered the bar or something like this. Um, and so this is not how we did it. The way we did it is simply by making the program so popular that we had such a massive applicant pool. You know, we had, we had 2,000 applicants for these 150 positions that it's just simply easy to curate a class as you wish to curate it, right? Because there's there's many more good applicants than than positions, and and uh, this is of course a big chance in data science because it's so popular. It's upon us to change this culture, and it's changing. I have to say, so the representation of women um, and also minorities in these data science programs it's much larger than in the constituents: computer science, mathematics, statistics, and so on. And and that's one thing. And there's a lot of awareness of that problem because when I, I'm coming, so I'm a computer scientist and a mathematician, so I come from a very technical perspective, right? I look at algorithms uh, and, and how they, they are built and designed. Um, and the first uh, mantra early on in our area was let the data speak, maybe five years ago, 10 years ago. Nowadays, people don't say that anymore because letting the data speak, everybody has understood that the data speaks with a bias. Um, and it's particularly important, I think, in the development of new technologies where there's a lot of like image recognition, translation, uh, transcription of text. All of this relies on massive amounts of data, which is actually a huge challenge to get. I mean, a very important task in that area is to create these data sets. And, you know, what do people do in translation or image recognition? They just take all the data that's available. Uh, and uh, particularly for translation system, you must have tried this. Um, and that was something that people are now very aware of, but just as an example, right? You take all the language data and then you try to build an engine that translates from English to Hungarian. And Hungarian happens to be a non-gendered language. There's no he or she. And you know, you start with a sentence, he is a nurse, she is a doctor. You run it through Hungarian, you run it back, and what comes out? You know, she's a nurse, he's a doctor, obviously. Why? Because that is how the data looked like. And so I think um, there's a huge awareness now in the community, in data science, that the data is biased and the algorithms are biased. There is now a lot of work showing that a standard algorithm that simply does some sort of classification will always misclassify on a minority set. That's just known. And so there is now a lot of work um, going on to try to make algorithms be de-biased. But for this, you know, because often uh, the data is, okay, we can label it with gender, and that's, that's a very worthwhile um, endeavor. However, often um, gender comes in as a proxy, whatever, height, like medical data, right? women tend to be shorter than men, right? So height is a proxy, for instance. So sometimes we are trying to be de -bias the data and we're not aware of the cor correlates of gender data. And that, that also applies to minorities and, and all these other things. And I, I'm pleased to report that there is a lot of awareness of this. And because there is a large number of women now in that field, especially the young generation, and they now go into the workforce and they're aware of this. I'm actually rather optimistic that um, there's a big push for change and a big impact. 
Um, what we also do a lot is we build ethics into the curricula. And when we say ethics, it's largely about biases and, uh, you know. Um, so all, all our graduate and undergraduate programs, and that's not just NYU, that's really now across the data science community, is building in either ethics modules or, you know, standalone. We have a standalone required ethics course. And when we say ethics, it's all about bias and gender and, you know, policies and discrimination and all these things. Great. Thank you for that. She she very helpfully skipped along to kind of the next theme that we were going to talk about with both of our panelists. So I'll I'll turn to you first, Nuria. But you know, one of the things, um, and, and, and if, if we, we have, have time, time, I think, I think we can, we'll, we'll probably, probably have, have some time, time for, for, for questions, questions so, so we can, can open, open it up. up. But, but um, Nuria, yeah. if, if someone, someone doesn't, doesn't ask um, about, about this during, during the questions, questions, would love, love to hear some, some more examples, not only of some of the bias um, that you're exib you're, you've observed in your own work in, in data, but also some of the methods for combating that bias um, that, that you and colleagues uh, have, been, have been working on. But for now, um, what, what I want to go, go to is thinking about, you know, we're talking here about building the systems of the future, right? How do we build the data systems of the future? And we all know that there are going to be various, you know, legal, ethical, regulatory building blocks that are going to need to be a part of this. Um, and so I'd love to hear from both of your perspectives, and Julia, you started talking about it a bit from the university perspective, but what are some of those building blocks that we need to start putting in place right now um, in order to really ensure that there's a, a place for people of all genders to participate in and benefit from the data systems of the future? Yeah, so that's a very uh, good question. So I wanted to echo what Julia mentioned about um, data science being a new field, having the opportunity to uh, break all the, I would also say, uh, sort of like, uh, and through stereotypes about what it means to work in, in computer, with computers, you know, or in computer science, and what it means to analyze data. So what, what Julia was mentioning in terms of what is happening with having more gender diversity or more diversity in general in data science is not only happening in the US, it's also happening in Europe, for example, which is a, a region that I know really well. So indeed, there is um, hope that um, we'll have new generations of experts in uh, in data analytics, in, in machine learning, you know, to be able to analyze the data and so forth, that is more diverse than the traditional uh, situation that we had, you know, until now, which was mainly coming from computer science, uh, you know, degrees where still there is a lot of lack of uh, gender diversity. And then you were asking sort of like, what, uh, what can we do to uh, improve the situation? Um, so something that is happening worldwide is, um, I think right now maybe 30 countries in the world have defined their national strategies on artificial intelligence. Today, when we talk about artificial intelligence, we need to talk about data because the state of the art artificial intelligence systems, the ones that we use every day, the ones that you know are behind Siri and Cortana and the self-driving cars and every and, and Facebook and Google, etc., all of those systems are data-driven systems. So data is needed to train and to feed all these different sophisticated machine learning models that we are using today to implement intelligent systems. So because of, uh, of, of the importance of artificial intelligence in today's society and in the fourth industrial revolution, a lot of countries in the world are designing their national strategies or supranational strategies. For example, the European Commission just published uh, in, July, in June 2019 the, the um, European strategy around AI. Within almost every strategy, there are five pillars that need to be considered and that need to be worked on and that need to be part of the strategy. The first one is the technology, which we have talked about you know, a little bit. Of course, we are talking about you know, a technological area and there has to be a strategy regarding you know, investments in research and innovation and uh, businesses you know, that are using these technologies. The second pillar is the legal and the regulatory framework where these technologies are going to be used. Uh, in many cases, the legal and regulatory frameworks are from you know, the second industrial revolution or the first industrial revolution or even older, and we live in a very different world. So there is a, a world conversation right now in understanding 
what new legal and regulatory frameworks we need to be defined that anticipate a society where the agency or part of the agency in decision making, for example, is not done by biological homo sapiens, you know, human beings. For example, uh, in the European Commission, uh, I'm a member of a high level expert group called Business to Government Data Sharing, where part of the conversation and part of the report that we're going to be write, we're going to be publishing in the next uh, couple of months is going to be about a potential, you know, the a discussion on the need or not for a new regulatory framework to enable the use of data uh, for public good from you know, the governments and public institutions. The third pillar is ethics. And Julia mentioned it, it's not just in the national strategies, it is also in the university degrees and, in, and increasingly so in companies. There are you know, ethical frameworks, there is maybe a chief ethics officer, there are um, implemented to make sure that not only things are done within the law, but they're also done, you know, uh, respecting the most important, you know, values of the society where the technology is being deployed. <coughs> Having said so, there has to be an oversight in place for these ethical values, because otherwise you can have a very nicely defined ethical framework. You can have a figure of a chief ethics officer that has no power and, there, and then you can do whatever you want and just let it be a, sort of like an image, you know, superficial uh, thing that you do to improve your reputation, but actually has no actual uh, input or no actual uh, power, you know, within the institution. So I think it's very important to accompany this with some kind of oversight procedures to make sure that the ethical framework is complied with and is implemented. The fourth pillar is uh, the social pillar, is society, is education, is what we need to do to be able to, to make sure that no one is left behind, you know, including women and minorities. And the last pillar is the economy and the transformation of the labor market. And as I briefly mentioned before, um, we know that because of the fourth industrial revolution, there's gonna be a profound change in our labor market. We know that there's gonna be jobs that are going to be most likely semi-automated, but there's also going to be a huge growth of new jobs that are mostly going to be technology jobs and that we don't have enough people right now to actually fulfill them. So there is an opportunity for women because there is uh, a lack of women, as we mentioned, you know, in this field. So there is a huge opportunity for women to be able to uh, contribute, you know, and, 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 and join these jobs. Um, so this covers a little bit the spectrum of the areas and the actions, you know, that can be done at a sort of like at a national or as a, or as a regional level. For example, just now I came back from the presentation of the AI strategy of the Val Valencian region of Spain, which is a region on the east of Spain by the Mediterranean. And the president of the region has actually been more innovative than the central government and has published a strategy on AI for the region, even if Spain hasn't published the national strategy yet. So this is also very interesting because I think uh, beyond thinking in terms of national terms and and big governments. I think regions or cities, for example, the city of New York also has its own strategies regarding data, you know, and AI. So different levels of sort of like human organizations have the power and should feel empowered to define their own strategies to make sure that, you know, this data revolution and this, you know, AI revolution is actually positive in their societies and is inclusive and doesn't leave anyone behind. Nuria, thank you for that masterclass of an answer. If I look like I'm staring off into the distance, it's because I just discovered that with the reflective window back there, I can see Nuria's face while she's talking. Oh. It's great, actually. I was like, I have to keep going like this, but actually I can just see you right there. It took me all panel to figure that out. Anyway, I need more coffee, clearly. Um, you know, but, but thank you for that. And you know, on that last point, it, it made me think about, you know, there's actually kind of an interesting analogy here to, I think, what we see going on in climate action as well, actually, in terms of, 
you know, states and cities and regions um, within within yeah. larger um, nations deciding to uh, to take action themselves. So anyway, I think uh, maybe there's some things to learn from that. Uh, so Julia, I'll turn to you, and then I think do we have time to open for a couple of questions? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so on this on this piece of the legal, regulatory, ethical um, kind of building blocks that we need to be thinking about right now and putting in place right now before this train leaves the station entirely, love to hear any further reflections you have. Um, on the legal framework. So uh, as I said, um, I think there has been a transition in our understanding of what data science is um, before people would just said, let's take this mass of data and it will speak for itself and we'll just do our thing and everything, all the good will come out. Um, I think um, now there is more and more of an understanding that even at the lowest level of taking the data and preparing it to enter whatever system or an extraction of knowledge or anything, there is a process which either biases or debiases the data. I mean, it's literally how I prepare the data is half of what answer I want to hear that, uh, still. Uh, and this awareness, um, I think, implies that uh, we need to have a, you know, a, a representation, a varied, a diverse representation at the level of people who actually do this work of preparing the data to answer these questions. So I'm coming back um, to saying that having an inclusive and diverse workforce is perhaps even more important now than it was, uh, well, it's always, it's always been important, but now this might be some sort of solution to to having the data being uh, more and more used in an unbiased way. And uh, in that sense, we need also an appreciation of diversity. So I have, it's an interesting, my personal experience, I have worked um, in between, I had an interlude in my academic life where I worked in a hedge fund and there were two women and 52 men. And um, it worked okay. I mean, you know, I didn't even realize uh, so much uh, what the issues were, and we made money. Uh, but <laughs> but then I came to um, NYU, where there is a lot of effort made to have a very balanced leadership group and group generally, and I started appreciating the efficiency of diverse groups. So the leadership meetings are a hundred times more. Okay, don't quote me on this um, on my employer, but they are much more efficient. This is on this the record. Just agenda, yeah, no, I know. Uh, I feel um, there is a much more efficient um, consensus building and um, solution finding in diverse groups. And I think we had a pre-discussion before this meeting. Um, so the solution is, of course, to have these diverse groups find um, solutions. Why is it not happening? It is somewhat disconcerting, of course. I mean, we all want to clone ourselves and we all feel more comfortable in an environment that contains clones of us in some ways. There is some human tendency to do that. Um, and what we are trying to do and what I think ethical frameworks uh, and regulatory frameworks have to, have to continue doing is um, expose people to the idea that diversity is really contributing, both economically, there are these numbers, 16 billion, you heard it, um, but also on a level of personal experience. Um, so I don't know if I digressed very much from your question, but um, I observe that this is more and more happening in data science and a lot of effort should be put into this um, inclusive environment. Thank you for that. I feel like I always like to have a takeaway with the panel. And I feel like one of the takeaways that I'm hearing is how much we all like thinking about every person in this room needing to encourage the young people in our lives to consider um, data science and and uh, and statistics as a as a career option and really to increase that representation within within the community. So I'm going to open it up to um, a couple of questions. We have about 10 minutes for questions. So um, I will I will open it up. Um, I'll go to you, sir. Could you, if you could, there's a roving microphone. This is Elizabeth, who's on our team. <laughs> um, if you could introduce yourself, where you're from, and ask your question. Thanks. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is Mehimir Purian. I'm uh, coming from Women's World Banking. Um, f uh, following what you said, I'm also kind of optimistic about future. Um, but I, I think that it comes with pain. And somehow, if we change the system, the pain will, would be less. What do I mean? Many of the things, let's say in academia, for example, um, whatever you want to do, you need recommendation. 
And if you are uh, in an environment which is mainly dominated by men, um, we think everyone is good. However, there, we know there are, there are biases there. So that recommendation should come from someone if who has bias. You know, so that, those are obstacles. Okay, we know that there are more uh, women in technical expertise these days. However, so that's why I say the future is bright, but it comes with the pain and it's kind of slow because those, there are so many obstacles that are not based on your expertise. They are based on subjective opinion of a person that may be biased. So how we can overcome those obstacles? For me. A simple question. Is that for is that for Julia or Nuria? Both? Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. So I mean, I can I can start maybe. This is a topic that I've actually studied for some time, and you're totally right. You are um, making reference, for example, to what is called a gender bias, which is a scientifically demonstrated bias that every in individual has, meaning that both men and women systematically tend to underestimate women. So we women underestimate ourselves, we women underestimate other women, and men underestimate women. And the most, I would say, canonical uh, example or, or scientific experiment that identified empirically gender biases is called the Karen versus Brian um, experiment, which I assume maybe many of you know. So what has been done, for example, to combat this? So something that the... Um, orchestras uh, have done for quite a few years now is uh, using what is called gender blind auditions, where when the candidates to enter the orchestra need to play in front of a jury, so the jury determines whether they're good enough or not, they decided to introduce a black curtain so the jury doesn't see the gender or anything else of the musician and they only hear the musician. So they are evaluating the music the musician is uh, producing and nothing else, you know, about that. Of course, having this level of gender blindness is not necessarily uh, possible, you know, in many fields. For example, in uh, in the research field or in academia, it's very difficult because you have all your papers and then the papers you don't have the names on it. And in fact, sometimes I feel that maybe I've benefited from the fact that my last name is Oliver because I think many people think I'm a man because they think that's my first name, even though it's my last name. So, uh, so yeah, so that's definitely uh, an issue. Another issue that you alluded to regarding the recommendations is if we apply this gender bias to ourselves, women, we, uh, and I'm, I'm generalizing, and I'm speaking sort of like in very general terms, you know, um, uh, we women tend to um, t take fewer risks and, sort of like apply ourselves less likely than men to promotions or to recognitions or to awards because we believe that maybe we are not good enough, even though, you know, we might have the best curriculum, you know, of all the applicants. So what some institutions are doing uh, with success is every time there is an opening for a position of leadership, and some uh, awards are doing this also, every time there is an award, they actually require that there is a diverse candidate pool. And if the pool of candidates is not diverse, they might declare the position uh, empty until they manage to get a sufficiently diverse pool of candidates. Because what is obvious is that if there is no diversity in, there is not going to be diversity out. I mean, if you have a pool of candidates that is not diverse, you're not gonna have diversity you know, as a result of the process. And there was a very clear example a year ago in Spain that um, fortunately received a lot of negative press and made the government change. And it was the following example. Uh, for a few years, there wasn't any national uh, research award in Spain because of the economic crisis. And last year, for the first time, they gave these awards again. They gave the awards in five categories of research. And I think it was some chemistry and technology and you know different fields of study. Out of the five awards, they gave them all to men. So instead of the headline being, after you know a few years of not giving the awards, the government is finally you know giving the awards again, you know, and it will be a positive you know piece of news. The headline was, 
they give these awards for the first time in X years and none of them is for any woman. How is it possible that there is no single, you know, brilliant, you know, researcher in Spain, you know, to deserve one of these awards, uh, a female? So what they did for the second round of awards, which I think they were just given a couple of months ago, was to make sure that the pool of candidates was diverse. Because the reason that they gave for not having diversity in the awards is because they didn't have any diversity in the candidates. 80%, I think it was, or more of the candidates were men. Uh, so that's another strategy that can be used, forcing that for you know promotions or positions of leadership or recognitions, there is a sufficiently diverse pool of candidates. Uh, and to do that, you need to take proactive actions. You need to contact a lot of people. You need to push women to apply, you know, even if they feel that they might not get it, uh, because I think it's absolutely necessary. And also it helps to create female role models so other women realize that there are women that are, you know, doing, uh, you know, that are having positions of leadership or there are women that are getting recognition. or there are women that are sort of like taking risks, you know, and, and going beyond their comfort zone. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I see a question over here, and then I just, I don't want to be biased against the other side of the room. <laughs> and I see a question there. Okay, so um, maybe we'll do back-to-back um, -back questions, and then, and then we'll, we'll go to answers. Thanks. Hi, my name is Elise Vogelai. Um, I just graduated from my master's program. Um, and my question for you is you both talked about sort of bias in AI and data, which is a thing that has been talked about obviously a lot and importantly recently. Uh, and so I was wondering uh, from both of you if you could give an example of what you think is a, a data science project, an AI system that has successfully de-biased itself or that you think is sort of an example of where we should be heading, sort of a, a positive example, I guess. Thank you for that. And then, uh, Albert, I'll go to you. Thanks. Hi, I'm Albert Motivans from Equal Measures 2030. So thanks for the presentations. It really feel, feels like we're getting the cutting, cutting edge here, which is exciting. Um, I was in, um, just a couple days ago, hearing Raymond uh, Perot speak uh, from the Stanford Center on AI, and he was raising some of the same issues that you are around, kind of the gender differences. And just to, to point out, the, the AI index that they uh, produce has a number of these um, figures that they monitor on a regular basis, you can find, find it online. I was wondering if there were other kinds of data sources that could be used to kind of capture gender bias in AI on a, on a more standardized or global level. Um, and then secondly, I'm also interested in the, the social impact side, which was alluded to at the beginning. Um, I'm having trouble, and maybe it's just me, but having trouble like finding where the center, the center is or where, I mean, kudos to Data2x for bringing, for bringing this kind of community together, but where do we look? Where do we find it? Is it all kind of buried in different sectors? Um, is there a central place where people who are interested in using AI for social impact, especially around uh, gender inequality, gather or communicate? Or where, where can we find those kinds of um, places to meet? Thanks. Thank you for that. Julie, I think I'm going to turn to you first on, on both questions, actually, if you're... Right. So, um, uh, is there a central place? Maybe that question should actually go to you. What I observe at the university is that every university is now establishing an AI for social good something, be it an institute or a center or an initiative. Um, maybe Emily knows better where they all congregate. Uh, maybe they don't yet. Uh, it could very well be. But you can just Google it in any university and you'll find it, right? So, but I don't know, maybe you know more. I mean, I would say, yeah, in terms of, I think we've observed the same thing in terms of AI for social good, um, kind of mushrooming right around so many places, um, not only in the university community, but I think in other communities, and even in the NGO community. But I think this kind of impact from thinking about big data and all of its forms, including AI and gender, there's not necessarily a, you know, an easy gathering place. I think there's different groups that, that work on it. Um, and I think Megan has something she wants to say. Um, so I'll turn to her in a minute. But, um, but anyway, I think it's an opportunity for the future. I'll just say briefly. Megan, did you have a comment on that specific question or? Yeah, I had two really fast things yeah. related to answers here. One is um, on specific examples. Can you just introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Megan Smith. I'm going to be talking later. It's awesome to be with all of you colleagues on this hard work together. Um, I served as the United States Chief Technology Officer 
<clears throat> under President Obama for three years. I have a tech background, mechanical engineer. Um, and we did a lot of the AI data policy work uh, that started in this country, um, including town halls and this kind of gathering, like collective genius work, because it's going to take all of us. Um, the thing I was going to say is there's two things that I think are cool examples. One is called Hack the Pay Gap started by two presidential innovation fellows and hundreds of uh, data scientists working on the actual pay gap as the Department of Commerce released some income data. So there's really cool examples, and I'm sure the speakers have them, of great things to your question uh, earlier. The other one is Joy Boo Alamwini's work at MIT Media Lab when she wasn't being recognized by face recognition. She put on a white face. She's a poet, coder. A uh, wonderful piece supported by the Ford Foundation called AI Ain't I a Woman? Sojourner Truth uh, comes live again in how face recognition is super discriminatory, especially intersectionally. A young or old women of color are the worst recognized, the highest recognized in the 90s are pale skinned male, middle aged, and younger uh, who are coding. So what's the great news is, you know, instead of just admiring the problem, um, the IBM team and other teams began interacting and changing their algorithms. So there's good examples of things you can do and proof points, even if they're nascent, you know, we're in kindergarten on this, but paying attention to call the problem and then actually work on it is out there. And the thing, the reason why I bring up hack the pay gap is because this idea of um, AI for good always makes me think is all the other AI for greed. So, you know, like, so what are we doing and how do we stop this bias in which subjects are relevant for this work? All subjects on the planet, anything you are interested in is relevant for this work. And so those who are the faculty at the computer science departments think that all this stuff is for precision medicine and um, it's only for... Uh, um, self-driving cars and ad tech, but actually it's for justice and equality and anything we want to use it for. And so people just need to take their power and step into it. And the key that I would say is have a cross-functional team, so data science people, policy people, ethics, everybody's in the team, not we're outsourcing the tech people from the policy or that the tech people are all alone. We have to get cross-functional or we can't. The problems are so hard that we can't do without that. So thank you. Great. Thanks. Um, thanks, Megan. And, and really helpful. And I like the, yeah, it's, it's, is it AI for greed? I mean, there's a whole panel that I'm sure could be done um, on that, on that topic. Um, but I'll just say, you know, we only have two minutes left. Um, but uh, so I just want to make sure that we go to um, both Julia, did you have another, an additional answer to, to the question that came up um, on the examples of where you've seen data sets de-biased? Okay. And then, so I'll just turn to both of you for a quick last word. Nuria, may I go to you first? Yeah, I just want to make a comment uh, to the very uh, good point regarding um, where to go if you want to work on this topic, because as you very well said, there's, there are initiatives now popping up like mushrooms, and I think there is a lot of fragmentation. So some big events that are trying to at least uh, gather a lot of the relevant people are... Um, there is the ITU AI for social good conference. France just organized a couple of weeks ago a conference on AI again for social good uh, in Europe. Um, uh, so there are two or three big events that are trying to focus on AI for social good. And then there is the United Nations World Data Forum, which uh, has uh, taken place twice. And it gathers about 2,000 people working on the use of data for achieving the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and, and for social good, basically. So that's also a good place to meet relevant stakeholders, you know, and to meet relevant people. Um, the only part, so I'm very happy that there are so many initiatives because as someone that has been working on this for over 10 years now, I think it's great that there is critical mass and that there is a lot of interest. Having said this, and I mentioned it already with the, with the concept of the oversight and the ethics, I'm also worried that some of the initiatives are nothing but a name because it looks really good to say that you're doing AI for social good, you know, or that you're doing big data for social good, or uh, when in reality, maybe there is not, nothing behind it. There is no budget for these initiatives. There is no real projects. If there is a project, it's just a simple pilot, but it has no actual impact. So I think it's important to maybe it's now the time to really understand which of these initiatives are actually doing things and which ones are having actual impact mm -hmm. besides just being a name, you know, uh, that looks really good on any organization's, you know, website. 
And regarding the examples, I was actually going to give um, the same examples that were just given. Uh, the face uh, detection one is a, a good example because it has really uh, instilled change in the companies that were commercializing the face detection and face recognition software. It has, so it has really had the impact necessary to try to remove some of these biases once it was evident that the performance of the algorithm was very significantly different depending on your skin color and your gender. Thank you, Nuria. Julia, I'll turn to you for a last word as well. Yeah, so if it's the last word, so I want to I, I wanna inject a bit of optimism <laughs> into this conversation. Um, I think over the last five years, I've observed a huge um, awareness of these issues uh, to an extent where you really can't do data science at the university anymore without being aware of them. And that I think that's, you know, that's thanks to um, organizations and people like you and many others. And, and as a result, we really are now, uh, and there's a lot of also technical development to de-bias algorithms. I mean, I see it uh, on a daily basis. The translation systems have improved. I think my example might not even be true anymore. Um, I think um, it's, it's this interplay of representation of having, a, you know, more and more women and, you know, minorities in the field and this awareness that will actually play out well. I, I'm, I'm optimistic, but the awareness has to be there and the willingness to embrace this diversity. Well, I, I truly appreciate that comment and, and injecting some optimism. I'm also an optimist. I don't think I could be doing this job <laughs> for as long as I have and not be a natural optimist um, and a pragmatist as well. And I think, you know, I guess I guess I just want to want to close on on thinking about and this is a point that that Megan brought up as well, and that I think we've we've heard um, from both of our panelists in a way, but that it takes cross disciplinary teams as well. When we think about diversity, it's not only diversity in terms of the representation of who's in a in a, in a data science um, you know master's program, for instance, but it's also about how do we how do we work together from both technical and policy perspectives to really make a change? Because if we're trying to change the systems ultimately, people need to understand and be able to see, well, what happens, what changes if this algorithm changes, what positive impact can happen? And that's, I think, really only gonna happen if you can get technical, technically minded people and policy minded people in rooms together and talking about that and thinking about that um, in a collaborative model. So I think there's a lot of work to maybe still be done and it'd be great to think about with this community, you know, how we do a more effective job of that as well. So um, welcome ideas and thoughts. Um, but with that, I want to really thank Nuria, see your, your picture in the window that I'm looking at. Um, thank you for, for joining us um, online and, um, and I'm so glad the tech worked and uh, really appreciate that. And Julia, thank you for, for coming to be with us and representing the university perspective. It's been truly helpful um, and thank you to the audience as well. Um, I'm very pleased right now to introduce um, for a short presentation uh, my colleague Bapu Vaitla, who um, is a fellow with Data2x, has been with us us since the beginning, and he's been leading this work on big data and gender. And um, I'm hoping he can come up now and present some of our findings from this latest rounds of, round of work that will really kind of kick off some of our research presentations. So I'll turn it to, to Bapu. Thank you very much.